All right, so let's start. So those of you who have been in the core before, who have been in our graduate core, may have seen this before, so you might know what's going to happen. The rest of you don't, which is good. Um, and so, so basically I asked you a question, flip a coin, you know, three times, get two heads. And many of you thought the best answer was nine, right? And we'll talk later on about what that tells me about you as <laughs> I also note that this is the first class that gave me essays answers when I asked for a number, so you're, you're exceptional. <laughs> um, <coughs> so we're going to do BC and then go back to this exercise to figure out what, what this means. Okay. <coughs> so I showed you this tree. It has black and white dots. Okay. And I asked you something about the evolution of black and white on this tree. Right. What would you say? And so what you do is break up into small groups and talk about it a little bit. But what it tells you about, say, the rate of evolution of black versus white. Which one is more common? Which one, you know, do you do from black to white or white to black? How do you figure that out? Okay, so think back to the phylogenetics lecture. So talk to each other. At first, ignore the captions, and then later on, don't think about the captions. First, do it with ignoring the captions. Trying to figure out, and you know, we have something like this, where we have a huge rate this way, and a small rate this way, or like that. I thought somebody was saying, like, there's some clades. Like, everyone knows what clades mean. Good. So, good job. All right. Um, it warms each heart when you, know, when you learn the jargon. So, what do we learn? So, tell me about this story. What, what, do we, what do we see here? What are the patterns? Okay, say, say, it, say it louder. Why do you say that? Um. Okay, so so this sister, this sister, there's no sister. Yeah. Um, this is the way for black and white children. So let's say we start off white. What has happened with white change? White, white, black change or black change? Okay. 
In general, though, it seems, seems to be that if you start off light, you end up having more flat. So, you know, the most likely explanation is a fast rate of going from to flat. Right? So, a high transition rate that way. Okay? And traditionally, people look at this and get that conclusion. Okay? Now, to the caption. What this says is that actually, the white to black and the black to white rates are. Look at the pattern. Right, do they have marker? Take a message with comparison, right? Let's say I have here I have white, and then here this changes to black, and this changes to black. Right? What am I going to see? Well, if the black has a higher precipitation rate, I'll see a lot of branches coming up here, and this one over here. And it went up here, and a lot coming up here. Right? So this will all be black. This will all be black, and I'll have just these white. Okay? So I still get a high proportion of black, but just due to different purification rates rather than transition rates. So there's two different processes happen happening here. One is transitions along branches, and one is diversification based on the rate. Okay. <coughs> this make sense? Yeah. Okay. Why do we care? I guess it'll be on the test. Why else? Okay. Imagine you're a biologist, and I say, okay, we, in this group we have a whole bunch of things that are bee pollinated, the black ones, and a bunch of ones that are wind pollinated, the white ones. Okay. What could you use this sort of tree to figure out the answer to? Mm -hmm. Right. So you can do it as how the traits mediate speciation rates. And so in this case, it looks like the B pollinated has a higher diversification rate. Right. That's one sort of question you could ask. Okay. Um, and the problem is, in those cases, usually we would ignore the transition rates. We assume they're equal. Okay. In contrast, we're asking about is it easy to evolve B pollination or wind pollination? And we say, look, all these changes to B pollination. B pollination looks to be easier to evolve. Maybe it's under selection. B P pollinated. Okay, so you might draw that conclusion. Okay, so you draw the conclusions about whether it's diversification, or whether it's selection, based on how you interpret this diagram. Right? And traditionally, we we figure out one of one of either of those ways. Okay, and the variable that we're talking about today is we do it jointly. We look at both both ways at, at once. Okay. So, for example, here we, um, okay, um, this shows the various biases, right? So if we, if you have different conditions, different species, right? if they're equal, we estimate the equal condition rate. Right? And the truth is always an equal condition rate. Right? If they're not equal, we can estimate the two-fold difference. So that by ignoring the speech and attention, you get the wrong answer. And it'll be statistically significant too. Okay. So get wrong answers by ignoring this. Okay. 
Here we have the same sort of tree, right? Lots of black, few white. But here it's due to different tr transitions, due to these unequal rates, and the restrication rates are the same. Okay? Looking at it, you don't see these sort of rates or pattern, right? But the process is very different. So yeah. this is another issue with macroevolution. Oftentimes, multiple processes can give near, nearly the same pattern, or even identical patterns. Okay? If it's truly identical, then it's called non-identifiable. You cannot figure out what the, what, which, which, of the, which of the processes is happening, which, what the parameter value is. Okay? If there's slightly different patterns you expect, you might be able to take them apart, but you might have, need a lot, a lot of data to do so. Okay? So here's the basic model. Okay? So normally, we either look at just these transition rates and ignore everything else, or look at just these, these rates and assume it's equal. Okay. Now what we do is do them both at the same time. Okay. So let's go back to our talking about diversification, how you can estimate diversification well, but not extinction well, okay? So, here's the true value for lambda for trait zero, and true value for trait one, okay? And it's going to do an okay job estimating. Right? So, true values are here, here are all our estimates, okay? So note that all, not all, oh, oh, are at the top, right? in the scatter, in the certainty. If we go back to our simulations we did last time, simulating the same tree and the same parameters, simulating under the same parameters each time, we get very different trees. Right? So there's a lot of noise in that tree signal. Okay? So here we get some uncertainty. Okay. But, you know, it's hard to hard, but yeah, it's okay. Right. Right. Here it is for extinction. That's for the diversification parameters. Okay. Here it is for these transition rates. Okay. And again, a lot of uncertainty, but now we're doing okay. What we'll make it easier easier to tell these things apart? Uh, to estimate these estimate these rates better, basically to make these clouds of points smaller. Exactly, more data. More data of what kind? So if you only have one state change, right? If I have a tree, like this, right? I have some estimate of the rate of going from zero to one, right? And then how often I go back from one to zero? A zero rate, right? So it's going to, even though it's probably a non-zero rate, it's hard to estimate that. We had a bunch of more transitions. Yeah. Yeah. In the, in this case, yeah. Mhm. Mm yep. So that's what, that's how you know what the true answer is. Yeah. So we, we say let there be a q zero of point zero one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 In real life, what you, what you typically try to do is pick ones that are realistic. 
So you want want something that you know if you observe a certain mixture of states in the tips, you want your simulation to give you that sort of similar sort of mixture. If you're cheating, you some people make it you know to an easier case. Some of the doesn't work, they do a harder case. But in general, you should do a realistic case. Um, or something like this, you'd actually do a range of cases from easy to hard and show, okay, it works well here, but it stops working at this point. Okay. Right, so one thing is you want to choose something that has enough variation okay, um, for states. <coughs> um, we do some work in my lab where we look at pairs of states together. And sometimes you find that you never see, you know, state one one. And so we'll actually we'll, what the program what methods will do is say the est the estimated rate of leaving the state is infinite, right? You never see it. So how do you know how, how, how you never see it? Well, the minute you get in there, you go somewhere else, right? Is the rate actually infinite? Probably not. I right? have a problem for these methods. Okay, how else can we fix this? How else can we make, how else can we improve this? So then we get a little bit of getting more data. So when is the data that has enough variation, what else? Cool. Yeah. So we can put fossil tax in here. I definitely know where they occur. If I have to change the math a little bit, but it's useful. Good. Okay, what else? So a more general case of that. It's adding more species in general. Right? So fossils are one way of adding species, but it could be that you know, this is part of a bigger clade, and we can look at the whole bigger clade. Right? What's the problem with that? You know, so evolutionary biology is all about trade-offs, but so is actually doing evolutionary biology. Right? So what's the trade-off of adding more taxa? Good. What, in what way? Mm -hmm. Right, different traits, different processes. Right, if I'm looking at evolution of flower size in plants, and if I was looking at just, a, you know, inflorescent size in like daisies and relatives, that's one thing. I start adding in things like water lilies. So all different kinds of processes going on, right? That go, you know, now I can float in water and stuff, right? And so these methods are still pretty simple, and so maybe that would throw it off. Okay, this trade-off. Right. <coughs> and it's showing there's ways to do it. So originally, to do this, you'd have to have every single species in your group. Okay. So this is a problem too, right? So you know, hello North Korea, I'm here to collect your, your plants. No, you're not. So it's always hard to collect certain species, right? And these methods originally required you to have every single species. Right? Because we're trying to estimate speciation rates, and I'm missing all of these because of North Korea, right? you're going to get a biased estimate. Okay? We didn't really get all of them, and then later they laughed and said, you can sample species truly randomly, or you can deal with polytonics, you know, okay, like this group of mammals. So now losing fewer people in North Korea. <coughs> and so we talked about, this, talked about this before, right? So here's an analysis that uses this tree. And here we see, just like we had white and black, here we have uh, bluish and purple, right, on this tree. Okay. And then we estimate these rates. We have this distribution rate going in, self compatible, and we have these net distribution. One thing to look at though is you know, here's our speciation rates, and then here are speciation rates. So we need to the offset, but to move to the right. And so you can subtract them, you can do you can do the Okay. 
So here's their initial tree, right? Um, and so we talked about different ways. So I'm going through like sort of an empirical analysis as you can see how this is used. Okay. So here's the initial tree. So what do these branch lines mean? Does that go back to the project that we talked about before? Right. So, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. right. So, P is evolving. Right. We have A, T, C, C. And then at some point, we change. And this stitch has called substitution. Right. And so, Point O to P per site means that out of every P sites, one will change. What is this? Okay. So you can see here we quite estimated, and then we change um, three sites on a kind of base pair for each. Now, does that mean that you say like generally once at most? No. I could have this change and then this change again, or even change back. And so I might not see this change, but it still could have happened. Okay? This, this is an extra okay. So this is not an evolutionary change on the tree. We want to convert the tree into having an amount of evolutionary time. Why is that? Mm -hmm. well, we, can, we can estimate these transition rates and time units, right? So every per million years, I change from being wind pollinated to bee pollinated to bee pollinated. Good. And there's various methods to do that, and people argue about them, and there's hard work. And, and so, <coughs> in this case, now we have a new scale bar, ten million years. And then you can measure this. So just review, how can I tell the cloud doing diversity and wind split? Not me, quite add one correctly. <coughs> so, the tree, and then we go to use this model. Okay, they use a simple, simpler model where they turn off, they set this rate to be zero. We assume that we go from compatible to compatible. Why would you do that? Why would you not just estimate that parameter? Mm -hmm. So, the normal model, you have six parameters to estimate. Right? You have the speciation rate, and you take zero, the rate going from one to, uh, one to zero, the rate going from zero to one, and so forth. Right? They said, you know what? This guy is going to be zero. You just you know it's going to be zero. So you could have estimated it and found out, oh, yep, it's zero, it's zero point zero 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 one. Okay. So why, is, why go in there with your dry hands and say, nope, you shall be zero? What's the advantage of doing that? You simplify it, so. Excellent. Yep. The same amount of data, right? Now we have fewer things to estimate. Right? So now we can have sort of more data points per parameter value to estimate. So we'll probably get better estimates, which is why we want to try to simplify if we can. Good. Okay. What's the downside of doing that? It might not be zero, you might be wrong. Your assumption might be wrong. Right? And then you're going to get the wrong estimate about what the evolution process is through this wrong estimate. So then trade-offs and how do you how you do science? Okay. <coughs> so here's the model they used, right? Which is just the one we've been talking about. <coughs> and got these estimates. Okay, which I summarize as these estimates. 
and again, find this is difference. Okay. Any questions about this? So the big learning points from this part of the class, this part of the lecture, are one: if you need to ask for if you think that traits might be evolving based on both differential transitions and or differential speciation or extinction. You have to look at both those things at the same time. Right? Look at them separately because you can give you the wrong answer. Okay, that's one thing. The other thing I want you to learn is how we do an analysis like this. Right? We get a tree, we make it clock-like, we get our tip data, and then we put it into a model and estimate stuff from the model. Okay, questions about that? Yeah. So the, um, well, it depends on what you're doing at the root of the tree. So, so this is our tree. Pretty, so pretty clearly we have no change here, right? Well, <coughs> you know we had a discussion about what the, what this data is at the bottom, is it white or black, right, early on? What these methods typically do is they assume you have a chance of being zero or one, okay? So if it's zero, then great, you have one change. Okay. If it's one, it requires us to have, you know, a change here and a change here, and you change back to something like that, right? And so what you do is then you sort of average the rates between them based on their probabilities, and so that way you get a non-zero rate going from one to zero. That's one way that can happen. Another way is priors we'll get into later. Good yeah, question. Other questions about this? Okay. Okay. And he just shows they get a mean for each trait, and you get some uncertainty for each trait. Okay. And the <coughs> unit isn't that huge in this case, and the third of the value of the unit is pretty high. Okay. All right. So now likelihood versus Bayesian. Okay. So why does this matter? Well, many of the methods we use are based on a model. Okay. So that method we just talked about just now is based on a likelihood model, which I'll talk about what that means, wrapped in a Bayesian approach. Okay? And so a lot of natural evolutionary studies now use this sort of thing. All right. So here's the coin. I flipped it three times, got two heads and tails. All right? What's a good estimate for the heads for this coin? Probably probably the heads. All right? And many of you think it's 50-50. So if you think if I flip it again 18 times, I'll get nine heads. Okay, so we'll see what, what, you know whether that makes sense. All right, <coughs> and a Bayesian would answer one way, and a frequency would answer another way. Okay, so frequency using likelihood. Okay, so first you have to figure out a model. So all this. Stuff we're talking about today requires use of a model. Okay, and this is what we talked about how the, you know the Goldberg et al. paper they chose a model that had no transition rates one way or another. We have to choose a model here, right? So we could have a model that says the coin flips heads two thirds of the time unless it's sunny outside, in which case it flips heads one third of the time. That's a model, probably a dumb model, right? <coughs> we could have a model where the coin flips heads and the next time it flips the opposite way. So heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails. That's a different model. Okay. Um, we're just using a simple binomial model. So basic model where each flip is independent. Right? That's one of the SAS comments they found. Okay. <coughs> so we're going to use something called likelihood. Okay. So likelihood has a, like a common sense meaning. So you might say, you know, likelihood of 
so and so becoming winner of The Voice is you know pretty high, right? Um, it's, it's a show it's on, I think. Anyway, um, it's, it's similar here, but it's, it has a more precise meaning. Okay, so the likelihood of the hypothesis giving the data is proportional to the probability of the hypothesis. Okay. Um, often, often it's equal to actually just have this drop step. Okay. That's a mouthful. What does it mean? Okay. So in our case here, the hypothesis is just a given value for Q. Okay, it's probably of heads. And the data are just getting two heads out of three tosses. Those are our data. Okay. So we could use the binomial formula, right? And plug and chug there, right? So if you're out data, two heads in one class, you can plug in there. That's probably the data. Okay, you keep those heads. A different way to do it is say, what's all the ways I can get two heads on the three classes? Well, I could do heads, heads, tails. I could do heads, tails, heads. Or I could do head, tails, heads, heads. Right? Let's say the probability of getting heads I do it this way, right? So I have 0.4 times 0.4 times what? 0.6. Good. Here, 0.4 times 0.6 times 0.4. Here, 0.6 times 0.4. Right? We can probably plug in each of these. I just want to see one of them, so I just add them up. And plug and chug, and that should be equal to this. Okay. So, if you don't know math, you can do it this way. If you really don't know math, you can just simulate a lot of times to get the answer, too. Okay? That's like something people are working on as well as its approximate likelihood. It's actually a method. Just simulate a whole bunch of times until you get a good estimate for that probability. Right? But if you have a formula, use it. Okay? So what do we say? We say the likelihood hypothesis of Q point four, given our data of two heads of three classes, is proportional to point two eight eight. Or if we slot it most of us, you can say it's proportional to point two eight eight. <laughs> All right, cool. So here's the key thing. The actual approach is called maximum likelihood. We're trying to maximize this probability. All right. So the best estimate of Q is that Q that makes the data the most probable? What does that mean? Sort of in everyday speech. It depends on the data. I mean, in this case, yes, but in general, not necessarily. Yeah. It depends on the formula of what the MLE is. I mean, just, so basically, okay, so I have a coin that I flip two thirds heads, right? So I, if I said to you, the probability of heads is one tenth, does that make sense? No, it's a dumb idea, right? Why? Right. It, like, if, it, if it were actually one tenth heads, observing two thirds heads is very unlikely. Right? It's probably more likely to be two thirds heads. Right? So that gives us our observed data. Right? That makes sense? Okay. So, what I can do is just try a bunch of different values here. And so, our friend point four is right here. Right? Is likely to point two eight eight. Right? Is that the best estimate? No. Right? Our best estimate is right here. Okay. That make sense? Okay. 
So, <coughs> no. who got two thirds heads? Probably the coin getting heads for two thirds. So, I mean, this makes sense, right? Okay. But, you don't think that's the answer. None of you do. Well, none of you. Right? So, what's two thirds of 18? 12. So, is our maximum monthly estimate is 12 for this coin? Right? And if I said to you I had this, you know, random computer generator thing that spits out a number and spits out one one zero, what's the probability of getting one? You'd be, you know, saying two thirds makes sense, right? But I have an actual coin. And there's actually like candy or something riding on it, right? And when that's the case, you guys don't think it's two thirds. You know, luckily it says it does. Luckily it is a standard method that we all use. And yet you guys are saying it's nine. So you just not do math properly? Right? Well possibly. Right? Actually, what you're doing is you're doing something else as well. Okay? Um, <coughs> we'll talk about what that is now. Okay? And so, another problem with likelihood is it returns the probability of the data given that positive. So, they say the probability of getting this you know, observation is, um, you know, uh, whatever, two thirds of two thirds times one third. Right? That's the probability of this observation. What I actually want to know is what's my certainty in Q? Certain item that two thirds is half. We can solve both these issues by using Bayes' rule. Okay? So this is Bayes' rule. Alright? And does this look familiar to anyone? Yes. Okay, how does it look familiar to you? Okay. Yeah, so it's. He's a big poster. Um, right. Those of you who have taken basic stats, have you learned about conditional probability? Yep. So, like, you know, I have this circle, I have this circle. How much is it space between these circles? Yes. Looks familiar at all? No? Okay. Yeah. I mean, the problem with this is so biologists use these approaches all the time. In stats classes, you don't learn them much. That's why I present them here, so you can understand what biologists are actually doing. Right? <coughs> so, you know, if you look for a publication in biology, right, and you look through it, almost all these papers are using either lefty based methods or Bayesian based methods. Right? Even though I'm statue, you can test or whatever. Yeah, you learn a little bit about the here. <coughs> okay, so Bayes' rule. So, probably the data given hypothesis. That. So the word we learned for today. Like it. Yep. They're pretty likely. Okay. This is a probability. Probability of the hypothesis. Right. So before I look at the data, I just enter in what probability of two thirds is. Which we're looking at. Okay. That's called our prior probability. So prior to actually running the experiment. We have a guess of what the probability is. Okay. That's our numerator. And our denominator is just summing that up over all possible hypotheses. Right. So it's discrete hypotheses, you can just count them. Right? If it's continuous hypotheses, like probably getting heads, we integrate. Right? So another case where, where calculus, calculus is helpful. Okay. Um, and in practice, we do this with computers, and there's actually algorithms to do this too, so you actually have to integrate. Okay? So, what's this prior probability thing? Okay. Well, one prior is the agnostic prior, right? I don't know what the probability of the coin getting heads is. It could be any value there. Right? It could be zero, it could be one, I don't know. Okay? Another prior is coins really fair. So, they put a lot of weight on it. Okay. It seems like a lot of you are using that prior. Okay. A third prior is that coins and stats classes are never fair. Right? So I'm going to put all my weight on it being we're going to fair this way, we're going to fair this way. Right? 
These are all priors. How do you um, how do you decide which prior is best? Mm-hmm. Yep. So what you want to do is update your prior based on your data. Okay. And what we do, but when we we do that, and that's called making getting your posterior estimate. So your prior plus combined with your data gives you your posterior so the goal. Okay. So that's good. And that's what we're gonna be doing. Um, but in general, before you have, actually have the data, there's no way to tell which prior is best, right? Because I don't have any data yet. Okay. And so you can say, okay, I'm being conservative. I don't know anything about life. I'll call it here. You could say, I'm being conservative. I know something that you fair. I'll call it here. Right? And people can fight about this. Okay, like everything else in biology. Okay? In practice, people who are using software often um, use whatever prior the person who wrote the software program did. Right? So, for example, if we're looking at inferring a tree and we want to figure out how long branches are, you can put a prior on that. Okay? What people usually do is just say, okay, we'll use whatever is programmed in the computer, okay, even without looking at our data. Okay, which okay. All right, so here's our likelihood again. Yeah. Then combine our likelihood with our posterior, okay? So our likelihood, remember, was peaked at, at two thirds, okay? So if we have our flat prior here, we now have somewhere on the two thirds. If we have our part of the strong weight of being 50, right, it shifted a slight bit to the right, right? But, I mean, think about you. If I said to you, okay, I flipped the weight three times as two thirds heads, you would say, oh, it must be really biased. The right side has a lot of weight that's a lot of being fair, right? So this is a way of, you know, right? I flipped a thousand times and got two thirds heads, you like, oh, yeah, I'm like Bayesian approaches, right? So this sort of updates in that way that makes sense to me. <coughs> now, this weird prior, right, now with a lot of weight on it being on the side. Okay. And so this is just showing now the means of our, of our new posteriors. Okay? There's no way of showing it all. Right? So prior, Likelihood. Now, the nice thing about Bayes rule, most of the time, is that it gives us the probability that the probability is given the data. Let's go back here. Right? So let's say the probability of the coin being uh, greater than 50 50, change of getting heads, is. Okay. So if you think about our example here. Probably of my hypothesis. 
And this is the advantages of updating. So as I'm saying, you get these posteriors, as you get more data, if you're getting two-thirds heads, But until that point, okay, you actually just need about coins, and so this is probably a better estimate than this one. Okay. <coughs> um, but we'll see. Okay, so I'll talk about later. Okay. And so there's a debate in macroevolution over which approach is better to use. But if you use likelihood, where you don't have to put in any of this, any of this prior belief stuff, or use Bayesian approaches, where if you happen to know something, you can bring it into the analysis. And so people might try both, and then one, and so forth. Right. Any questions about this? And this is a lot of stats and math, but if you know how people are actually doing that revolution, there's two ways that typically do it. Yep. Yeah. Um, I worry a lot about priors, but some cases we actually do know something, and so it's nice to use priors. So, like, for getting, like, we were talking about, like, dating trees, getting ages for trees. So do I know that this fossil occurred at just 70.325 million years ago, and it occurs right on this branch? No. Right? So it occurs somewhere here, I have some uncertainty, and it, it, in this it group is probably at, at that age or older. Right? So you can incorporate that information well with a prior. So for that sort of thing, but I, I go back and forth. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, there are people who are philosophically pure about this, right? I'm not one of them. In another department, most people are both, or neither of them are both. Most people are both. You don't want to cherry pick results, or be like, oh, this result's cool, and this one's not, so let's publish it, let's see the Bayesian result. And you don't want to do that, but if you can show that your, your results are robust to your philosophy, that's cool, too. Other questions? Other questions? All right, I will flip and I'll let you know. Who gets the coin? Who gets the prize?